Thanks for tuning in. I'm Dennis Acheson. Today's guest is Matt DeCourcy, the incumbent liberal MP for Fredericton, New York. Fredericton. Fredericton is the name of the riding. Fredericton's yeah. name now. Yeah. So thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me back. It's good to be here, I think, uh, at least a third, maybe a fourth time in studio with you, Dennis. Yeah, which is great and much appreciated. Um, I was tempted in prep for you to show you some of the younger versions of yourself <laughs> <laughs> four years ago. Yeah. Um, it's fun. I did the same thing with, with um, other people to... Because they're in the grind of political life, mm -hmm. and it's not simple. Many people don't know what it's like. They think they know, but unless you're doing it, they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so what's it been like for you? Four years, um, you're now the incumbent. Four years ago, you were the rookie looking to make a breakthrough. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'd be I'd be more than interested to look back at, uh, at our conversation. I think the first conversation we had was when I was pursuing the nomination itself in early 2014. Um, and, and, and what I can tell people is that the Matt DeCourcy of 2019 <laughs> is a lot wiser than the Matt DeCourcy of 2014 and the guy who was elected uh, four short years ago. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. Mm. I've learned a lot. Uh, I, I was fortunate going into it that I had had the experience of volunteering in Fredericton and working in Ottawa for a predecessor of mine and somebody who is dear to this community, Andy Scott. Um, I had the chance to go work on Parliament Hill with Andy from 2005 and with he and another member of Parliament into 2007 and take that experience to bear on my further education and some travel and work abroad before coming back to New Brunswick to, mm. to settle into to life here. Mm. Uh, these last four years have, uh, I think, reinforced upon me the notion that I had at the beginning, which is that politics is about people. I mean, the word is derived from a word that means people. Mm. Um, and it really is about working with people, uh, making decisions that are in the best interests of people, and most importantly, uh, listening to people to come to that working together in decision-making ability. Yeah. Um, as you explain that piece, come to mind, several guests I've had on the show in the past are young people who have chosen to make their careers in New Brunswick. Yeah. Never crossed my mind that you would be an example of that same thing. Um, it's an interesting turn, right? Like to, to think of, uh, I've moved back home, I'm, I'm here now, and now I want to make my yeah. home better. Uh, two, <laughs> two things, I think, Dennis. Uh, first of all, we need to um, start delivering uh, a narrative uh, and a story to to young people here that actually there's a lot going on yep. in this community of Fredericton, in this province of New Brunswick, and Atlantic <clears throat> Canada has a lot to offer to the Canadian conversation and to the world. And I, I always think it is so damaging uh, when we talk, as some political leaders do, about the negative things that are going on in this community and not focus on some of the real positive opportunities that are being created here. So I think of that, there's a real, there are many opportunities for young New Brunswickers to stay, pursue post-secondary education and move into the workforce here. And or there are tremendous opportunities for young New Brunswickers to grow up go abroad, get some more experience, and then bring that back to bear uh, on New Brunswick, on the job opportunities here, and on the creation of more opportunity for folks who uh, traditionally have not had a chance to participate fully in the economy, in community development, um, and in community life. Yeah. Um, four years into it, you're looking at it with a more experienced lens now as you go through this election process. Um, what are the first things that pop to mind for you from the first time through to the second time through. What I'm thinking is, is the country becoming more polarized because of the influence of the United States and the American narrative and how polarized it is? And have we forgotten what, what Canada is? Because we always approach our politics differently, mm -hmm. but the influence of media over time seems to be eroding the, the sense of the whole, the negative element, which you've already kind of touched on. And then if you could turn it to or where the solutions are yeah. or, or, or where you feel uh, heartfelt that, you know, we're going in the right direction this way or that way. Maybe if you'll permit me, I'll take it up an even, an even higher level, uh, Dennis, and, and take a look at the trajectory of global history. Hmm. We are in a period of time where people are healthier than they've ever been, hmm. where rights are more recognized and people are more equal that, than they've ever been, uh, where people and communities and countries are more prosperous than they've ever been and safer. Not to d disclude the ongoing challenges that we see in the world, mm. but poverty levels are at all-time lows. Um, and not to disclude the fact that we see some backsliding 
on some of our neighboring countries who have been the partners that we have relied on to hold together the international rules-based order. We, we see some sliding on trade and on human rights in, in places like the United States and mm -hmm. in some of some European countries and in other pockets of the world in Asia and in South America. And amidst that, uh, despite some of the ongoing challenges in Canada and polarization, we still stand out as a model of stability in the global community. Our democracy is the strongest of the world, despite its warts. Um, our economy is one of the strongest in the world. And it's not just uh, because the wealthiest are wealthier. It's because we've been able to improve opportunity for traditionally marginalized people in this country. Hmm. More young people are working now than at any other point in Canadian history. More Indigenous people, more people with disability, more women. Hmm. Uh, members of the LGBTQ2 community have had their rights recognized more and more and more and I think are advancing um, in practical ways as equal members of the community hmm. across the country. And, and what we see is when things are more equal, when more people have opportunity, uh, you know, the rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're experiencing in Canada when we take a step back and look at ourselves amidst a shifting yeah. global dynamic. Yeah, because you're pulling back to a certain degree to, to gain that perspective. Yeah, um, but, but you want to, uh, like, to get back to some of the challenges we face, we, we are not immune. No, we are no. not immune to the, <laughs> to the pushes and pulls of populism, of uh, nativism, of, uh, of certain pockets of xenophobia and fear of the other. Yeah. And, and I think we need to push back against that forcefully and call people into the conversations around why inclusion and diversity makes us stronger. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and to practice it again. Exactly. Because well, it's gotten out of practice. You're, but, you're, but, but the way I... you're framing it up reminds me of this. Um, it's a Facebook post. The school teacher puts uh, five math formulas, real simple. One plus one equals two. One plus two equals three. There. But one of them's wrong. Yeah. And then ask the student, what do you see of these five things? And every kid's like, they point out where the mistake is. And the teacher then asks, and what else do you see? And there's kind of silence. And the teacher wanted to reinforce Four of the equations were right. Right. You all focused on the one wrong one. And, and that tends to be um, what you just described of all the things you see as positive happening <clears throat> gets lost in the, that one time we focus yeah, on the, yeah. and the one thing that didn't go right. So we got to keep working that, the four positives. Totally. And, and we have examples of where Fredericton has provided leadership on the positive elements. We resettled welcomed, resettled, and helped support more Syrian families than any other community on a per capita level across this country. Hmm. That's because Fredericton stepped up and did it. Hmm. Um, there are certainly challenges for newcomers, refugees, and all newcomers when they come to the community. Hmm. But I think there are many more success stories than, than, um, than negative stories out there that we need to focus on and use those success stories as ways to find solutions for the folks who still fall through the gaps. Mm -hmm. We've improved the situation uh, of service delivery for veterans in our community. Uh, I think what we learned uh, about governing with the decisions of the previous government was that you don't support people by closing offices and firing public servants. Those public servants, those Veterans Affairs officers, for example, do real good work in helping provide veterans with the supports and benefits that they need. And we need to take the advice of those people and ensure that they can provide the services that um, people transitioning from military to civilian life need, yeah. who often don't have some unique challenges that the general population doesn't have. Yeah. So, so I use that for an example as, as why, why and how Fredericton is leading the rest of the country as a model of support for people with challenges. Yeah. One of those uh, was on the show, Greg Shand, who did a great interview on um, dealing with PTSD yeah. and dealing with Veterans Affairs. Um, his take on it would be a little bit different than what your take is. He didn't really have an axe to grind, but he was watching a pattern and, and to speak on his behalf, he felt a little abandoned because he had lost two or three of his buddies in the past two or three months to suicide and was looking for a more transitional supports and was just sharing his personal story. Yeah. And I Th don't those, do are, those are being put in place. Yeah, and I be don't do it. So we can guard against those, those, those terrible stories we know that yeah. one suicide, one lost life is too many. Yeah, and I don't do it to kind of oppose a contradicting view to what you just said. I, I just wanted to bring up the natural tension in the process and mm -hmm. that you're working at it from your end. 
Greg is experiencing it kind of from his end from two, three years ago. Yeah. And it, it is all moving towards a certain direction. Yeah. But the, uh, the, uh, the other <clears throat> part of this is that these, these are uh, things that we never fully accomplish, right? They are contin it's continuous work that needs to be done. Yeah. Because the situations of individuals continuing, continuously change. Yeah. Uh, the dynamic on the ground changes, and we need to be flexible and adaptive enough to ensure that as many people as possible are finding comfort in the services mm -hmm. that are provided by their governments. And we're also speaking very lightly of a very complex system. Totally. So here's the MP dealing with public coming at him or her. Um, here's the bureaucracy or the civil service with an ingrained pattern to provide service to a certain level, but change has kind of come at its own rate within that service. And so those moving parts to try to capture what's needed in an 18-month or a two-year window yeah. compared to the four-year election cycle window compared to a 20-year window on really dealing with a systemic problem, that's we don't talk about it in that context enough. So we have patience to let stuff kind of nurture its way through. Yeah. Well, I... I I recognize and accept fully that uh, the challenges that an individual or that a family face are the most important, urgent issue to them, and hmm. and they and folks um, have a right to to seek urgent repair or restitution for some of the challenges they face. But as as you said, um, these services are delivered in a complex system of relationships and of service delivery mechanisms that aren't just unique to a federal bureaucracy, but that work in cooperation with provincial authorities and community level decision makers as well. Uh, so, so, so patience is something that we ask for, often at a time when people don't have much patience because they are in challenging situations, situations and or in crises. Yep. Um, changing the tack a little bit, uh, I would like people to hear your take on the impact of national media following a national leader, mm -hmm. driving a national narrative mm -hmm. through an election period. Um, and then the things that are important to you at the community level or at your constituency level and, and that gap there. Because it's like the national media have run with the blackface thing and just plastered it all over. I couldn't believe the Globe Mail a week and a half ago gave it like 10 pages in the front section. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, there's all these other things that should be talked about that are more relevant to an election process. And here you are as a candidate in a particular area with this kind of national media pushing that national narrative. What's it like to, to cope in that, to get your message out for your local community, as opposed to what national media wants to do, and also what they're not talking about? Right. While they focus on this thing, which has nothing to do with policies, and it, to me it must be frustrating as all get out. Because you want to get some things on the front because you've got a 40-day some odd window to say, here's our plan for the next four years. And it's important, so pay attention. And instead, we're talking about something from 18 years ago. And I'm not dismissing it. I'm putting it in the context, what's it like for you? Sure. Um, well, it, I, it can be challenging um, watching uh, the narrative be shaped by... Uh, by by the media and um, and I certainly have uh, a total respect for the role that the media play in a free and democratic society. They are there to hold uh, decision makers, um, politicians, and to account and to inform and educate the public about mm -hmm. issues. At their best, I I've seen that happen, mm -hmm. um, and other times I, I I think there is editorializing amongst some. Some some folks within the media landscape, um, I I've I've come to accept that that's a challenge that we have to navigate as as political parties, as politicians, as as a government. You're being very kind about all this. It's very good, though. Well, well, just just like <laughs> any any relationship in in community, uh, Dennis. Um, sometimes I agree with people, and sometimes I disagree, and vice versa. Yeah. Sometimes I agree with the story a, a media personality or outlet have put forward. Sometimes I disagree, um, but that doesn't diminish from the important role that they play. It, it would be nice to, to have uh, more accent placed on some of the regional uh, matters here in Atlantic Canada as opposed to yeah. just what the party yeah. leaders are doing each and every day. But, but I'll tell you this, um, 
beneath the media narrative are real conversations with real people in the community. Yeah. And you cannot uh, get better intel on what is happening on the ground than by mean streeting, stopping in at the coffee shop and knocking on people's doors. And, and, and that has always been impressed upon me and has been proven to me by practice of doing it mm -hmm. to be the best way to gauge what constituents and what communities are mm -hmm. talking about and what they care about. And that's a really nice turn because in past interviews with past guests, especially dealing with politics, there seems to be a general trend um, for all politics is local. It's almost like we're going back to that old cliche. But instead of saying local, they say it's community-based now. Mm -hmm. So while national media drive their narratives the way they need to do or, or how they choose to do, um, there seems to be this other movement, not quite a grassroots movement, but because of social media and because of access through social media, there's more opportunity now for communities to have better conversations about their needs and then how that fits into a national picture, a national strategy. Well, so, well, so do you have a top two for around here to give you the platform and say, here's the two things that I really want to see for the next four years yeah, for us. Yeah, I, I have a couple of priorities and, and, and I'll mention them right after I say, I think this is the key to um, being a federal representative is understanding the matters of importance to your local or regional community and being able to speak about those in the context of policy development and leadership that is meant to be in the best interest of the entire country. Hmm. Uh, again, as a federal government, that that is our role is to ensure the best interests, the safety and security and well-being of all of Canada. And and I take seriously my responsibility to bring the voice of Fredericton, New Brunswick and Atlantic Canada to bear on that. Locally, um, there there are some significant assets that we have here that I think can be further leveraged by the federal government. We have some of the we have some world-class post-secondary institutions that provide us with a base, a, a base to support economic development, job creation, and more opportunity for people in this community. Um, we've got Canada's most entrepreneurial university in the University of New Brunswick. We've got a community college that provides specialized training for people to move into the workforce, and a liberal arts university in St. Thomas that um, graduates some of the brightest minds uh, in the media, uh, people who go on to study and, and practice in law and a whole range of education, social work, a whole range of professions. Mm -hmm. I'm keen on seeing the investment in some of the emerging economies that are coming here to New Brunswick, like cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. I also think Fredericton can play a leading role in helping shape a more renewable energy future which helps us tackle climate change, which I know is a national priority for folks, mm -hmm. and, and certainly here as well, mm -hmm. through the investments that we're making in smart grid technology development. Better usage of the energy grid mm -hmm. to reduce uh, the amount of emissions during peak hours and help redistribute that in a way that, that causes less pollution. Mm -hmm. so, so support for the research and development in our institutions, which leads to economic development and opportunities for folks is one. We have, secondly, uh, one of the fastest aging senior populations in the country. Um, f a focus on healthy living and making Fredericton more and more uh, a recognized leader in that field is important. We've been able to make investments in the new Center for Healthy Aging at UNB, which is providing practical research on a whole range of ways to support better aging in home and in the community for folks. Mm -hmm. We've got great work being done in reduction of um, psycho-inducing drugs at the York Care Center, a pilot initiative that started in Fredericton that's now rolling out around the province and in other jurisdictions across the country. And we're supporting seniors with better income benefits and pension benefits, and I'm keen to roll ahead with Pharmacare to ensure af affordable and available prescription medicine for mm. an aging population, but it's something that benefits all people. That's two. Thirdly, uh, the Fredericton community includes Oromocto, mm. the home of Canada's army, mm. the second largest military base in the country, one of the largest training centers amongst our NATO allies. Supports for the women and men who serve in uniform and veterans are of significant importance for me. Uh, because they are they are the people who help make that community and the surrounding area tick, and I've I've developed a great appreciation for the positive impact that our military have on 
peace and development around the world. Uh, during my time serving as uh, parliamentary secretary to Christa Freeland in foreign affairs, mm. I had the chance to visit mm. parts of the South Pacific, um, um, Africa, South America, and Europe, and, and see the training that goes on and how our military helps support um, building capacity in uh, unstable regions of the world mm -hmm. and and I've seen how military support leads to stabilization and peace which allows us to further our development impact which allows economies to grow and people you know in places that have traditionally been impoverished to find work mm -hmm. and that keeps countries all of that cyclically keeps countries stable and mm -hmm. a more stable world is good for Canada mm -hmm. <clears throat> two things cross my mind when you do that one is um, it might not cross your your table uh, because of the the work that you've done, but but food, food and farming, it's got to integrate itself into New Brunswick's narrative more. Um, a friend ages ago told me New Brunswick is built on three F's: forestry, fishing, and farming. Forestry and fishing get lots of attention still. Farming seems to have dropped off somehow, some way, and maybe I'm just not aware of an undercurrent if it's coming back. But past guests on the show talk about, you know, there's almost a million acres of un underutilized or abandoned farmland as we got into more agribusiness instead of that. There's a lot of younger people and immigrants who have farming in their bones and, right. and they want to be, <clears throat> and we import 95% of our food. So globally, as patterns shift worldwide on food supply and food development, our little province and our little corner of North America could be really well situated to being more self-sufficient, self-sustaining. Does that ever cross your mind at all or it, your path? It does in the development mm. of, of food policy uh, for the entire country. And I know that we, we have seen a renewal of within, you know, within the stewardship of the agriculture department and minister for um, stronger local uh, food initiatives and, um, and, and the other vein which it's crossed my desk is is uh, in thinking about how newcomers, immigrants, can help uh, succeed, succeed, succeed mm. in, um, in 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 buying and owning and operating new farmlands, or, or I guess pre -exi pre existing farmlands, and, yep. and making them new again in New Brunswick. So I, I do think there's an opportunity to enhance our food security locally. Mm. Uh, and, and in some areas, New Brunswick can be a leader in certain crops and, uh, and, and, uh, and ensure that our school system is better fed and that our students are better fed. And, mm -hmm. and I know there are some cooperative initiatives going on locally with different farmers um, and different schools mm. uh, and school districts to, to help build that out and uh, and and i'm all for supporting uh, local food uh, and 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 healthy communities hmm. and the, the farming and the agricultural economy here in new brunswick hmm. <clears throat> take a slightly different turn four years ago um and i was trying to lay out the space for you to wander into it so <laughs> that the public could see you know it's not simple people so quit throwing darts you know yeah. try to listen with some empathy so now it's four years later, so it's almost the same question, but now you've had a lived experience. So I remember asking you, at some point in time in your journey as an MP, you're going to have your constituency saying, do this. Yeah. And then you're going to have your political party saying, no, no, you're going to do that. And you're going to have to play in that space somehow. And I vaguely remember your answer was, well, I'll do my best to communicate all the pieces on all sides and then see how that falls. Well, when uh, I could pick electoral reform or one of those things where you, you knew what your constituents wanted and you knew what your party wanted. And it's not to put you in a box. I just want people to hear what that's like sure. and, and how, that, how that goes down so yeah. that they have more understanding of the process. Yeah. And that, you know, Atlantic Canada, we've got probably a disproportionate number of MPs based on population. Here, here, Constitution. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that, that kind of thing. So it's... It's not as if we don't have access. It's not as if we're, we're outvoted. But somewhere in that whole process, it would be really nice if voters, to yeah. me anyway, laid off a little bit and tried to understand um, what that's like for the person who gets elected. Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll start with, you know, election time and then talk about, you know, maneuvering these issues uh, during period of, of parliamentary session and governing. Yeah. I mean, at, at election time, um, 
my view in 2015 and again now is that I'm making commitments to the platform that we put forward for Canadians and the general thrust uh, that that is elaborated upon through those commitments and 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 it's about uh, increasing opportunity for more folks to be a part of the economy in Canada and and to create more wealth that we can share with more people in this country um, so first and foremost that we, we've also committed uh, and have a record now uh, and and more commitments ahead to tackle climate change in a serious way mm-hmm. and to do it in a responsible way that leaves no one behind um, so so we make commitments uh, and and maybe the third pillar of that is a commitment to to respect the human rights of each and every person in this country hmm. and then and then we get into the day-to-day of of parliamentary action and governing and and there are tough decisions to be made uh, about votes on on particular niche issues that fall within or outside of the general agenda of the platform that we've committed to as a governing party um, I think when I was here last I said there are times when I voted on issues where I felt about 51% in favor of it and 49% opposed to it uh, and sometimes it's not clear black and white yes and no decisions but our our democratic system is premised on people standing up and saying yes or no in parliament so I don't get to I don't get to uh, cast my vote with an asterisk that says yes I believe this 52% and I believe that my community is divided on this issue as well I also have made decisions where I have had a chance to be informed by my colleagues that um, something that is being proposed through a private member's bill fits closely but not quite adequately enough within a general thrust that the government is already taking or is planning to take. So, um, you know, there could be an issue of, 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 of more accessibility uh, to housing and, uh, and, and there's just a little bit of language that puts it offside with a grander initiative that government is working on that will achieve the same results mm-hmm. and put people in houses in this country. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. so again, it's not always black and white, yes and no. There are comp- there are there are competing interests in 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 motions that are put forward in the House of Commons in considering how to vote on a private member's bill, um, but what I do is consult with with my colleagues to figure out how if I think it is a positive bill that we that we just can't support because it doesn't fit within the entire structure of of the government's agenda how are we going to advance Mm. in the same way and 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 usually uh, actually I think in every situation I've been comfortable uh, casting a vote no for something that I know we will see in, in a broader government agenda. Hmm. Yeah. I think I followed you. Yeah, well, I, I well, know but, but it's, here's I know the it's thing, tough. it's complicated. I, yeah, I want to anchor it in a specific, and, and then, but that might be unfair, and I, I want it to be fair. Yeah, yeah. So in social media terms, it's now election time. Yeah. And people are interesting beasts, so they'll remember the conversation from last time. So if you haven't seen a friend for five years, ten years, you tend to pick up more or less. When that, True. Elections are you know, I remember four years ago, he said this or she said that. Yeah. It's got that dynamic to it. Yeah. So when when Prime Minister, then not then Prime Minister, but says, you know, this will be the last election with a first-past-the-post mm-hmm. system, mm-hmm. then media will hang that soundbite and hang the soundbite, but you're the one that has to live with it on the grassroots level. Yeah. And then it doesn't come to pass, and mm-hmm. we're now in another election period. There would be a whole complicated process that you, you've done your best to help us understand what it's like inside. Yeah which is great, and thank you for that. But then, now we're in the next election, people are remembering four years ago, and then the social media stuff, take it for what it is. Yep. It's not a poll, and it's not accurate, and it, but it's a feel. Yeah. Um, they promised this, they didn't do it, no way I'm voting for them next yeah. time. And there you sit in the crosshairs of that, well, let me address, that dynamic. Let me address you know? the whole issue, and, and I'm, I'll start by saying an independent study that was put out by a research institution out west uh, has looked at our commitments from the last campaign and said that we have delivered on or on track to deliver 93% of those. And and I will admit, it was an ambitious platform and an ambitious agenda. Mm. Electoral reform was something we said we would do, and, and we didn't move forward with it. And I think there's good reasoning for it. 
Uh, when people are talking about electoral reform, what I hear is that they want more influence for their members of parliament to have a voice. And to offset the lobbyists and the influencers and stuff. Sure. What, right, right or wrong, but that would be a perception. Okay. Um, and lo and behold, I end up on the committee that is traveling <laughs> the country studying electoral reform. Um, and in, in the end, and I'll get back to how I got there, in the end, I didn't feel it was appropriate or a good idea for us to move ahead with electoral reform. And I was clear in the report that we wrote as, as members of the committee that we didn't think it would be a good time to do so. And so I say we were listened to by the decision makers, you know, in the prime minister and his office and cabinet. We traveled the country. And my whole goal was to find a way to help ensure we could increase voter turnout. We had about a 77% turnout in Fredericton last time, I think 72% across the country. That still leaves 28% of people out of the decision-making process. I'd like us to get up to 100%. And what we found was that no system, no matter where they are uh, employed across the world, unless there's mandatory voting, which we heard clearly Canadians don't want us to move forward with, mm. uh, increases voter participation and voter turnout. Um, so I say without a clear uh, ability to do that and the potential to confuse people and dissuade voter turnout altogether would be irresponsible to move ahead. I also have seen since it fail in two referendums, one in BC and one in Prince Edward Island. So I'm not convinced that the appetite is there across the country for us to move ahead with electoral reform at this time in the country. The reforms that we did move ahead, which we committed about ensuring voter participation, were giving Elections Canada its mandate back to educate yeah. people about the electoral process. We uh, established greater resources for organizations like Civics and Samara and Apathy is Boring to work in the schools to educate younger people about the electoral process and about democracy in Canada. And I've seen that at work now locally over the last couple of weeks. Mm. We established a voter pre-registry for 16 year olds so that they can become informed as they're preparing for their vote at the age of 18. We've made it easier to vouch for people who show up without an ID at the voter poll because it's everyone's right to vote. Mm -hmm. And we've made it easier for people living abroad with Canadian citizenship to vote in the election. Mm -hmm. So I think those have a tangible capacity to help ensure more people can vote. Uh, and I, would, I wouldn't say that uh, the idea of changing the voting system is dead forever, but I don't believe that at this point in time we figured out how to use it as a way to increase voter turnout. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. No problem. A um, couple minutes left. We can wrap up a bit. Um, yeah, we're in an election period. If people are watching and paying attention, um, you'll see how Matt works, which was the whole intent of the interview. Um, rather than posing a script of questions and we answer them and you get lost in it, you know, because that's what you vote for right. is the person who will represent you. But we haven't touched on um, you and what you would like to see and uh, and how you want to wrap this up because you've got another, what, three weeks or so to go. Yeah, just about three weeks. Yeah, so you're in the thick of it. Um, I'm sure you're pounding through different debates and <laughs> all oh, yeah. of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, debates and doors. Yeah, debates and doors. <laughs> and... And uh, what am I trying to get to? If the next breed of politician can start to get rid of the, the negative feeling uh, around being politician, yeah. Yeah. Um, just, just so the process actually does have some integrity for all its quirks and quirks. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm remembering uh, 20 years ago, a study done. It's a junk information kind of study, but... Politicians beat out used car dealers for the most untrustworthy professions. And I thought that's, you know, in a way it's to trying to be funny. And in a way it's brutal because all of our collective decisions are made through this process. And we've done that to the people who aspire to be part of that process. You know? So if we can start to show more respect for people who put their name forward to be a candidate and listen to the sincerity and the authenticity of it, and recognizing it's it's going to become a challenge when you slide up to Ottawa and you got to get into it. Mm. What's what's that been like for you? Because you bring you bring all of you to this. Yeah, you can't miss it. You know. I've learned I've <laughs> learned not to hide from the fact that 
I am a politician and I'm proud of that. Um, I think five years ago when we did this, I characterized myself as a public servant and, 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 and we serve the public and that's our role. But I don't hide from the fact that I am a politician and I think politicians do themselves a disservice when they try and convince people that they're not actually politicians. Politicians are people. <laughs> we are real life people who, um, who you know who are in serious businesses right like like it's a serious business politics i guess what i'm trying to say is um we take our job seriously but like all people we try not to take ourselves too seriously because we're real people Hmm. Um, i enjoy coming home and going for a run along the river i enjoy laying on my couch and watching netflix to chill out after a, a long week i enjoy the craft beer scene here in fredericton I love harvest jazz and blues as much as anyone else in, in this community. I love to travel. I mean, I, I'm a real life person who cares deeply about the stewardship of this community in this country. Hmm. And I love people, which is why I love this, this job. Um, and, and I know that it's a continual effort to earn, retain and, and re-earn and re-retain the support and trust of people in the community. But I don't shy away from ever telling people that um, I'm a politician and I'm happy to be one and, and, mm. I'm, and, I'm, and I'm proud of the record that I'm standing on in this election. I know it's not perfect, but nor is anyone's record as a human being. So um, I, just, I just am out there working away, trying to earn people's support and trust and, and hoping that they'll see that in me and that they'll send me back to Ottawa to represent them for another mandate. Mm. Thank you the, the other thing I want to say, Dennis, <laughs> if I can, is, is I've learned, too, that the magic of Canadian democracy is the diversity of people who come with different experiences at different times in their life, with different levels of education and uh, views on how the world works that makes this country tick. So young people ask me, well, how do I get into politics? I say, you get into it the way that you get into it. There is no magic formula hmm. to this. Yeah. Go do what you want to do in life and you'll find your entryway into politics. Well, that's a nice touch because what was in the back of my mind as I listened to the first half of that was that do you think do you think politics could ever be collaborative? <laughs> because our national narrative tends to be you know divisive or confrontational because mm-hmm. that's the nature of some of the national media. But there's another voice in the mix that actually really is collaborative. It's a bunch of people trying their best to make things work, and uh, that voice doesn't get heard a lot in our national narrative. I'm old enough to remember listening to Camp Kearns and Lewis on Peter Zowski's Morningside. And so you got Dalton Camp with his hard scrabble conservative thing. Hmm. And I had the chance to meet him a couple of times, so yeah. that was fun. And uh, Eric Kearns with his liberal historian perspective, and Stephen Lewis, when he gets going, he's just blow them out of the water oh, with his he's oratory. You know? with his oratory, yeah. So they would fight, they would giggle and laugh, they would reach consensus, they would agree to disagree. But all through those conversations, was a model of this is how Canada holds together yeah. for a political process side of it. Because each one of them really cared about Canada. So even though, you know, I want to do it this way and we want to do it that way, but they all agreed that in the end this is kind of the goal. That was 25, 30 years ago now. I would love to see that come back somehow as modeling the behavior that this is how you mean the whole, maintain the whole together while having these fascinating deep conversations inside. Yeah. So when, when you touch on, well, you just get into it the way you get into it, it it's almost the same spirit. I, I like to think that at our best, we do exemplify that spirit. I think it gets picked up a lot less than some of the divisive conversation that is out there. And, and, and mm. I was talking to a group of students this morning saying, I, I think we all find ideas that we look to uh, build our own platforms better from all the different political parties and all the different views that are out there. Um, and and there's collaboration in that way from a from a grassroots level on up. Hmm. I also think it's 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 completely worthy to take a stand on issues where we have differences with other folks, and that doesn't need to be nasty. Hmm. But but taking a stand on something we believe in is is important as well, and and people can do that in their day to day lives, just as political figures and political parties and governments can do as well. Understanding that. Uh, we need to be humble, and and, and have an, and and have an understanding that not everybody agrees with everything we do, <laughs> and and I've learned that over the last number of years as well. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I believe it. Um, how do you want to send us out? 
I want to I want to thank you for the opportunity to come back here because it gives me an opportunity to speak genuinely about issues in a way where I'm not boxed in, um, and, um, and and maybe I hope that through the conversations we've had over the last couple couple of years, you've been able to see some of the the maturity and wisdom that I've gained through this whole process, and I hope that people in the community see that as well. Um, I'm, I'm not the same person I was 10 years ago, five years ago, or today. I think I hold the values that I held 10 years ago and five years ago and today just as strongly as I did then, but that's all. That's based on the upbringing I had and the fortune I had to, to be born into the family and the community that I was. Mm. Uh, but um, I've, I've gained a level of humility and empathy that uh, I didn't necessarily have five years ago, 10 years ago, that I think has been helpful uh, in in guiding me through some of the challenging situations in Ottawa and Fredericton and with some of the opportunities I've had to represent the country around the world. Hmm. You don't want to end with vote for Matt? <laughs> well, I you know, I mean, th- it's an election campaign and and uh, and I've been in a habit of asking for people's votes at their door and in the community and and certainly um, for those who will see this, I I I certainly like uh, to count on their support and their vote when they make their choice. Most importantly, I think people should go out and vote. Mm. I'd like to see a, a, a high voter turnout in this community. Um, I, I think my own personal record and and the, the platform that I stand upon with my colleagues in the party from across the country is one that can continue to help Fredericton, continue to provide more support for Fredericton, and through that, I think that we can continue to serve as a model hmm. of economic growth, social inclusion, and, and diversity, which, which I think is the strength of the country. Thank you for this. Thank you. Appreciate it. And thank you for watching. Um, please support the show. Click Patreon or PayPal. That would be appreciated. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. Mm-hmm.